would like coffee yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Well, if I can ask another question. Yeah. Yeah. It's nothing to do with me. The juice is very comfortable. It's always just administration of business to hold it up and prepare it all. They all need to stay on. I'm in the side of the house. I'm in the side of the house. Good afternoon, folks. We, uh, General Pace and I and some of the senior people in the department just spent a good session with the senior um, uh, leaders in Congress, the chairman and ranking members of the Armed Services Committee in the House and Senate, and uh, the chairman and ranking members of the Appropriations Committees, subcommittees, I should say, and uh, most, most of them are there. I think one couldn't make it. But um, we have been discussing the Quadrennial Defense Review and the budget with them and look forward to the hearings tomorrow. Uh, I just returned from the annual conference on security and policy in Munich, Germany, the Verkunde Conference. Um, I should say that many of those gathered positively discussed the need for close cooperation as we wage the uh, global war on terror against extremists who pose such a serious threat to our free systems. In Munich, I noted the, this challenge uh, requires us to, all of us really, to try to recalibrate our strategies and re-examine our defense budgets and, and our funding priorities and uh, perhaps further rearrange capabilities for an era of asymmetric, uh, irregular threats. The President's budget request for the Department of Defense represents an increase over last year. It reflects what we should believe should be the country's national security priorities, namely to help defend the United States of America and the American people and their interests, to give flexibility to commanders, to prepare for both conventional and unconventional or irregular warfare, and importantly, to work closely with partner nations to help them develop the capabilities needed to defeat terrorists within their borders and to cooperate with us and other countries with respect to this global threat. Uh, the budget will also fund some of the decisions drawn from this year's Quadrennial Defense Review, although that's not what it's designed to do. Uh, the bulk of what comes out of the Quadrennial Defense Review will be taken into account as the budget bill starts now uh, to be presented next February, and um, all that has been done are to take the things that were 
became readily apparent some months ago when there was still time to incorporate them into the budget, which I would not want people to think represented uh, a, a major portion of the um, vectors and direction that came out of the Quadrennial Defense Review. Uh, I know there's a temptation in Washington to view everything in terms of winners and losers and zero-sum games. Um, I should say that the QDR and our budget request for 2007 and thereafter should not be measured in terms of programs or winners and losers, I don't think. These are not standalone documents, uh, but rather calibrations in our direction as we continue transforming to meet the new challenges. Um, I've asked Tina Jonas, the controller of, the, of uh, the department, to be here along with her team and, and experts in various aspects of this budget to uh, be able to make a presentation and then respond to your questions. I understand there are then some breakout groups on specific subjects that, that will be available for all of you uh, to um, get the kind of next level detail. The QDR, of course, has already been made available. and. Uh, with that, I'll ask General Pace to make a, uh, some remarks, and then uh, we'll turn you over to Tina and her team and others. Pete? Thank you, Senator. Pete's going to make some yes. remarks. One, one question of you, if, if you don't mind, just, you just one question. Pete talks? Yes, sir. Good. That's fine. Thanks, Charlie. Do you want just one for you or one for each person oh, in the room? One too. <laughs> <laughs> well, just one for you. I see. I see. Well, thank, you. thank you, sir. I just returned from a visit to uh, South Korea where this past Friday I participated in a change of command where General uh, Leon Laporte, who relinquished command of the UN Command, the ROC U.S. Combined Forces Command, and U.S. Forces Korea to General B.B. Bell. General Laporte wraps up four outstanding years of service to our country and to Korea, and uh, General Bell is coming out of command of U.S. Army Forces in Europe and will build, I'm sure, on all that uh, General Laporte has done for the last four years. While there, I also had the chance to uh, visit some of our troops training on a tank range, uh, second division troops, and 29 of those soldiers uh, re-enlisted. I had the great privilege of re-enlisting them in a platoon formation, uh, some for their first re-enlistment, some for their third, and they were voting with their lives uh, to say that they know that their service to this country is, is valuable and valued. This budget uh, that is being uh, rolled out today and the Quadrennial Defense Review that was released uh, last week culminate an extraordinary year of collaboration and cooperation between the senior civilian leadership and, the, and military leaders in this department. And together, they certainly make sure that we will be able to prosecute the war on terror, that we'll be able to enhance our joint war fighting capabilities, that we will be able to accelerate transformation, and that we'll be able to provide proper quality of life for service members and their families. And I'm glad today that uh, Vice Admiral Marty Chanik will be assisting uh, Secretary Jonas in answering your questions. Thanks. We really are planning to not take questions, but. I guess it's, it, it's unanimous. Everyone wants Charlie's question to represent the rep views of the 55, 60 people, 100 people in the room. Wait, wait, Charlie, you have the floor. Charlie, you have the floor. This, this budget represents major investments, increased investments in the area of the Army, Special Forces, Intel, mobility, the ability to, to, to confront problems of unconventional warfare and terrorism. And yet there are those who say that an area of, uh, that a time of very, very austere domestic spending cuts in many domestic programs. You haven't made difficult choices to perhaps make cuts in major Cold War type programs, very expensive programs such as the F-22. How would you answer that, sir? Well, like very, very simply, that the senior, as General Pace said, the senior military leadership and civilian leadership of this department spent the better part of a year um, assessing the period ahead, 5, 10, 15, 20 years out, looking at the kinds of challenges that our country is likely to face. Uh, we recognized, as I mentioned in my remarks, the uh, 
need to see that we had capabilities to defend the American people here at home. We recognize the reality that the we have been very successful in deterring uh, the threat from large armies, navies, and air forces. On the other hand, um, those threats haven't disappeared, and the kinds of capabilities that are necessary to continue to see that, that they are deterred and dissuaded uh, require investments. And uh, they, they are so not something that you can turn the switch on and off and have those capabilities. They take years to develop, to, uh, uh, to plan, to develop, to, to initiate, and finally to manufacture, produce, deploy, train, and, uh, and uh, outfit units capable of, of using those capabilities. Uh, the, you're correct, quite correct. Uh, we also are faced with a variety of, of challenges that are considered to be asymmetric or irregular. And we simply, as an institution, have to not stop doing what we were doing and start doing something new. Uh, we have to look out at the world and say that the, the single most precious thing we have here that protects our freedom and uh, the prosperity of the American people is their security. And, and uh, that, that that does require investment. The investment is large. Uh, it's small as a percentage of gross domestic product at 3.7 or 8 percent. Uh, when I first came to Washington in the Eisenhower-Kennedy era, uh, we were spending 10 percent of GDP on defense. Uh, when I was here 30 years ago as Secretary of Defense, we were spending, I think, 5 percent. Today it's 3.67 uh, or 8 percent. So it's, it is a relatively modest portion of every dollar, but it is something that does underpin the, the freedom and the opportunity and the prosperity that exists for the American people. Mr. Secretary, one question for General Tate. Perhaps I have a General question. We'll sign off. Uh, one I have one for one General budget Tate, question. Too, please. Um, you mentioned in your opening remarks that this budget would allow uh, the U.S. to accelerate the transformation of the Army, but s some critics are saying that the growth in the Army, particularly in the Guard and Reserve, is, is not as much as it could be uh, with more uh, resources. Can you just comment on that? Well, I think the Army has done a terrific job of balancing the active guard and reserve in a way that truly represents a single United States Army for the United States of America. And in taking 33 active brigades and growing them to 42, in taking 15 somewhat capable uh, um, National Guard uh, brigades and growing them to 28, and in sustaining a total of 106 uh, National Guard brigades and a total of 56 uh, reserve brigades. So the Army has paid enormous attention to the capacity that they need across the force, and they are d devoting not only in this budget but in the in the uh, out years $21 billion, specifically earmarked, to buying the proper equipment and providing the proper training to the Guard and Reserve. Yeah. One quick one for General Pace, please, sir. One General Pace and I are going to be responding to questions most of tomorrow and, and most of Wednesday. This question. is a budget day. Yeah, but he's just back Good from afternoon. South. He's just back from South Thank Korea, you. Mr. Secretary. <laughs> we need to find out some things about the war. Good gentlemen. Thank you, Thank you, you have the war. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for being here. I'm here with uh, Admiral Marty Chanik from the uh, joint staff who uh, has worked very closely with us over the, the year uh, in developing the budget that we're going to talk to today. So as the Secretary and the Chairman have uh, just said, the world has changed dramatically since the end of the last century and the Department is changing along with it and we are refocusing our forces and capabilities for the future. Since 2001, we have shifted our strategic balance away from the static Cold War construct of the past to the speed, power, precision, and agility required for the challenges that our nation faces today and will continue to face in the future. So consequently, we are looking very closely at our strategic uh, priorities. Uh, this budget uh, was developed in conjunction with the Quadrennial Defense Review. The Quadrennial Defense Review was the first conducted in the era of global terrorism. 
and we continue, this QDR continues the shift in emphasis uh, by identifying key strategic priorities. The fiscal year 2007 President's budget request for defense is $439.3 billion, a 7 percent increase over what was enacted by Congress last year. And the budget invests in capabilities and forces necessary in these key strategic priority areas. First, to prevail in irregular warfare operations, including wars of long duration like the global war on terror, to defend the homeland, especially against catastrophic terrorism and other advanced threats, and to maintain, as the Secretary said, our U.S. superiority against threats from other nation states. And of course, underpinning all of our activity, uh, we continue our strong support for the men and women in uniform uh, in the quality of life. I'd like to ask uh, General Ch or Admiral Chanik to talk a little bit about the uh, capabilities uh, that we're pursuing in this budget. Uh, thank you, Tina. Mm -hmm. uh, these priorities that you see up on the slide and the supporting capabilities are the product of continuous assessment. As many of you are aware, and as the Secretary mentioned in his opening comments, we began constructing this budget over a year ago. Services uh, work hard in January, February, throughout the summer months, uh, and in September submit that to the Comptroller. And from September through December, the Comptroller and services work uh, very closely together to provide the product that you'll see today in just a few moments. At the same time, in this last year, we also had the, a parallel process ongoing at a slightly different timeline, and that was a quadrennial defense review. Uh, the quadrennial defense review, uh, while the output of that actually occurred after some of the, uh, the, the budget was well along on its uh, uh, path, did allow us to get some leading edge uh, uh, investments and indicators in that fiscal year 07 uh, budget, and you'll see that in just a few moments, and as the Secretary mentioned. The Quadrennial Defense Review took our national military strategy and operationalized that strategy, and it did it through the lens of the force planning construct and of the four focus areas. Uh, those four, four focus areas were defeating terrorist networks, defending the homeland, combating weapons of mass destruction, and shaping the uh, choices of countries at the cro uh, crossroads. As the Department assessed these capabilities needed to succeed in the four focus areas, capability sets emerged and those capabilities include, but are not limited to, the following types of investments. Investments in joint mobility, in intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets, in methods to combat weapons of mass destruction, uh, in increasing the sizes of our special operation forces, and accelerating the Army's efforts to create a more modular, deployable, deployable force, in building joint maritime forces for nearshore and inshore operations, in orienting joint air capabilities to increased range and persistence to larger and more flexible payloads and the ability to penetrate and operate in denied areas and advancing joint command and control with the requisite uh, net centricity. This group of capabilities are core elements in meeting the department's priorities that you see on this slide. Winning the war on terrorism, defending the homeland, accelerating transformation, strengthening joint war fighting, and taking care of our people. So as you look at this budget, as you'll see in a moment when Ms. Jonas brings up uh, the uh, subsequent slides, you'll see that we are capturing vectors in the QDR and making initial investments this year. It's a budget that gives warfighters the tools needed to sustain our traditional warfighting while we enhance irregular warfare capabilities against the asymmetric uh, threats like we face in the global war on terror. Tina? Okay. Uh, so in the area of investment, uh, prevailing in irregular warfare operations and to improve our reconnaissance and maritime special operations capability, the fiscal year 07 budget substantially increases the size and capability of the special operations forces. We fund an additional 14,000 special operations forces growing from 50,000 in fiscal year 06 to 64,000 in fiscal year 2011. We grow 4,000 in this current budget. We increase our Special Operations Forces combat battalions by 33 percent. We fund the recently established Marine Corps Special Operations Command. Uh, we fund the Special Operations Unmanned Aerial Vehicle Squadron, and we also increase our Navy SEAL Commando teams. The budget includes $5.1 billion. This is a significant increase over last year, a billion dollars over the enacted level. Uh, as a frame of reference, it's double what we had invested in the year 2001. 
Additionally, to prepare for irregular warfare, we're investing in language skills. <laughs> to equip our forces with language and cultural skills that they will need for 21st century missions, the budget expands language and cultural awareness training. The budget provides the resources to increase language competency of general forces in, in languages like Arabic and others, expands the language training for special operations and intelligence units, increases pay and recruitment of native speakers to serve as translators and interpreters for operational forces. Uh, the budget includes $181 million. Uh, this is a substantial increase of $149 million more than we had last year. Uh, it's a $760 million investment over the program. Increasing combat power will also meet the needs of irregular warfare operations. I think General Pace mentioned the investment in the Army, and we, we invest substantially in Army uh, combat power. To increase Army combat power, the budget provides funding to increase the number of brigade combat teams from 48 to 70. The conversion of regular brigades to modular uh, brigade combat teams will make the Army more flexible, effective, and deployable against a wide variety of adversaries and importantly will increase the Army's rotational pool and reduce the frequency of deployments and provide greater stability for soldiers and their families. The budget includes $6.6 .6 billion uh, for these conversions and includes $40.6 billion over the program. I should note we had uh, $5 billion uh, in the uh, supplemental last year for this initiative. This uh, has gone into the baseline budget this year. The budget provides funding for ground force modernization as well, and the Army's future combat system is a key uh, element of that modernization. To continue the modernization of, uh, and integration of ground forces, to produce a swifter, smarter, and more potent and deployable force, the budget provides continued funding for the future combat system, and you can see the three major areas of investment. The primary purpose of these are to improve our lethality and situational awareness, uh, and the, the Admiral can talk to some of those capabilities uh, if you're interested in that in a moment. Uh, the budget includes $3.7 billion for the future combat system. This is an increase of $600 million over the prior year. Uh, additionally, to increase U.S. intelligence gathering capabilities and enable persistent surveillance 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the budget procures 322 unmanned aerial vehicles, which includes our available missions by uh, increases our available missions by 75 percent uh, and expands our persistent surveillance capability. We also provide research and development funds uh, for uh, future unmanned aer aerial vehicles. The budget includes a billion seven. Uh, for these uh, capabilities and 11.6 billion over the program. Yeah. So uh, 22 is not just one year. That's over the yes, whole. Yes, sir. Program. That's that's right. 11 billion is the investment over the program. Yes. Um, additionally, uh, the budget addresses defending the homeland against a variety of 21st century threats. To counter the threat of catastrophic weapons such as advanced biological and nuclear weapons. The budget provides a billion seven in 07 and 9.3 billion over the program. This funds additional acquisition of improved detection systems, additional new generation vaccines, and invests in capability in the capabilities to neutralize potential nu nuclear threats. In addition to these capabilities, we continue to develop and deploy a national missile defense system, and the budget improves our missile defense capabilities by including $10.4 billion in fiscal year 07. This includes our theater, intercontinental and theater ballistic missile uh, capabilities to expand coverage in critical areas and enhance our early warning capability. In addition, uh, to, we want to maximize our homeland capability and it's vital that we expand our global communications. We improve our global communications by investing uh, 900 million in fiscal year 07 and 9.3 billion over the program plan to expand satellite capabilities to deploy troops around the globe and substantially increase the speed and amount of data that the military can now transmit and receive. In addition to defending the homeland against advanced threats and refocusing our forces uh, to prevail in irregular warfare operations around the world, 
As the Secretary said, the United States remains committed to maintaining its conventional military superiority. And in that area, we are improving our joint air support capabilities. The budget includes substantial uh, investments in uh, aviation, particularly the A uh, Apache, the Chinook, and Black Hawk helicopters, as well as the Osprey V-22s. Uh, we include 113 of these aircraft in this budget and 798 uh, of these aircraft over the program plan, very substantial. In addition, our joint air capabilities uh, to improve joint air dominance and global strike, uh, which permits for uh, a freedom of maneuver for air, land, and sea forces. Uh, the budget provides $10.5 billion. Uh, we include the F-22 Raptor, uh, the F-18, and the Joint Strike Fighter, which is just coming online uh, this year in the budget. We are also, addition, in addition, we are also investing in our joint maritime capabilities uh, to improve our maritime support to joint forces. We invest in multi-mission ships, including two uh, destroyers, DDX destroyers, two littoral combat ships, one Virginia-class submarine, one amphibious assault ship, and one logistics uh, ship, a TAKE. Our fleet will expand from its current 285 to 304 by the end of the program, and the budget provides $11.2 billion uh, for this fleet. Uh, underpinning all of this investment, uh, the success in everything that we do depends on the men and women in uniform and their de dedication and skill. And so in order to support uh, our men and women in uniform, we increase pay by 2.2 percent and provide uh, expanded targeted pay for certain warrant officers and senior enlisted. We include a billion nine for bonuses and incentives to recruit and retain highly skilled personnel. And we maintain our commitment to no out-of-pocket uh, costs for housing and increasing uh, the, uh, this area of the budget by 5.9 percent for individuals so that they uh, do not have to spend from their pocket for housing. In addition, this budget completes a commitment to eliminate uh, the remaining 49,000 inadequate on-base housing uh, units. And we provide other quality and life investments, including a billion five for the construction of new on-base living quarters for unmarried enlisted personnel, uh, new child development centers, and for new educational uh, schools and <coughs> projects. But the quality of life uh, means also looking forward uh, after the health of each service member and their family. And to that end, the department provides one of the best health care coverage plans in the nation. Our goal is to, to continue to provide the highest quality care to our military personnel and their family placing the pr by placing the program on a fiscally sound fr foundation for the long term. Our budget includes $39 billion in 07, which is an increase of $2 billion over the prior year, to provide health care for retired and active duty military personnel and their families. Uh, the cost of, uh, by including some changes, we, are, we will uh, control the costs uh, of health care that are still predicted to rise by 31 uh, percent in this budget. I'd just like to explain some of the adjustments that we are going to make to the plan. Our current uh, TRICARE plan uh, included the cost sharing feature which was established by Congress in 1995 and it was an important feature of sustaining the benefit. In 1995, the department was paying 73 percent of the cost share and beneficiaries paid 27 percent. Today, the cost share for the department has risen to 88 percent and the beneficiary cost share is at 12 percent. So the department is proposing some changes to help uh, reduce uh, uh, the likelihood of a, uh, fiscal, fiscal problems in the future to the health care. We want to sustain this benefit and we're going to make some slight changes in the premiums for, uh, for working age um, retirees. Uh, th let me just stress something. These changes that we're proposing in the budget will not affect active duty members. Uh, but we are going to increase the cost share uh, to less than the 1995 level. Uh, if we were not to take action uh, in this area of the budget, our projected costs by 2011 would be over $50 billion. So we're making some slight changes in that area. And I have uh, Dr. Bill Winkenwerder is here who's available to answer some questions afterwards. 
Um, let me just finish up and then we'll take some questions. Uh, so what does it look like? Our budget is $493.3 billion. This is a $28.5 billion increase, 7% over the enacted level. And we believe we provide the needed capabilities for future challenges, provide advanced technology for improved operational capability, uh, provide robust pay and incentives uh, for recruitment and retention, and provide a superior health care coverage plan for 9.2 million uh, service members and their families. Apple Chan. From a quick point of clarification, yes, I, I think it said 493. Did you mean that or did you mean 439? For, for, 439, pardon me, yes, yes. I was wishful thinking on my part. Good, good catch. That's before OMB got From the warfighters' <laughs> perspective, uh, this is a budget that supports our armed forces across the spectrum of capabilities and threats. And while it ensures our service members and their families are the best trained, best equipped, and best supported fighting force in the world. It's aligned with the department's priorities. It meets the needs of the combatant commanders and the services, and it's informed by the QDR process. It manages short and long-term challenges and is what the joint warfighter needs. And with that, uh, we're ready to field your questions. Uh, Mr. Jonas, you, you've uh, mentioned a number of major increases you've made in the defense budget. Mm -hmm. Have you made any major cuts anywhere from last year? Well, I, I think, actually, I'm glad you raised last year because I think uh, You've covered our uh, department for some time, and you know that we've made some significant uh, changes in previous years. And I think we, uh, the Army will tell you, for example, it made some uh, reductions over the years to its, some of its aviation programs to reinvest in various areas of, of, of avi uh, aviation. Uh, we have made some reductions, but I think we've got a pretty healthy budget here. Uh, our procurement accounts were a good indicator of of the health of the budget, uh, $84.2 billion in this budget, uh, up uh, significantly from last year. So that's an important feature. Our research and development is up, uh, and we our sci science and technology budget is also significant at $11 billion. As, as you well know, one of the busiest aspects uh, of the U.S. military today are ground forces. And I'm just wondering, if the, is there a way to quantify, if you count the increase in special forces, uh, um, the, the Marine, the new Marine units, the expansion, uh, to, to what extent is there an expansion of the Army? How many more troops are we actually talking about that are going to be fielded under this budget than are fielded today in terms of ground forces? Right. The total numbers of the uh, forces, if you count in total numbers, will, will uh, remain approximately the same if you look at end strength. But the challenge that uh, has been out for both the uh, ground forces, both the Army and the Marine Corps, has been how to make, uh, how to change the tooth to tail ratio if you want to look at it that way. The other way we say it is the operational army versus the institutional army. Uh, army has a goal that they want to get in that operational army, the two side, uh, 40,000 more folks. And we believe we can do that uh, by the rebouncing of the, of the people we have today in that force structure that exists. Marine Corps has also done the same thing by adding two infantry battalions and two them. So, so the effect uh, is with that same number of folks is uh, more capability uh, by, by rebouncing uh, what the forces do inside of that. So just to be clear, that, that 14,000 uh, additional special forces, that is uh, a result of rebalancing the end strength you were working with now? That is correct. Admiral, <coughs> QDR says that the, by FY11, the Marine Corps end strength will go back down to 175. Is that because you're assuming that the Marines will be out of Iraq by then? And given that MARSOC has stood up why is end strength going back down instead of going up? Yes, uh, we always uh, we continuously look at end strengths, uh, but uh, we'll wait and look at what the conditions of the uh, world are. Uh, obviously, we don't know exactly uh, when uh, things may get down to a little bit less uh, intense in terms of no uh, number of troops deployed to the Iraq Afghanistan area, but. As that comes down, then we think the end strengths can go very close to what uh, uh, you saw in the QDR report itself. Mm -hmm. Any uh, QDR long-term question? Uh, 08 through 013, you're supposed to see the major reflections of the QDR. Mm -hmm. Now, when we come here next year and see this, will we see large increases over the future year's defense plan versus this year? I calculated the long, the, the top lines between 07 and 011 this year. It's about 2.38 trillion dollars. Mm -hmm basically the same plan from last year, 
Is the expectation here that you're going to grow that top line over the next six years by a lot or make adjustments within roughly what you're announcing today? Yeah, I think the assumption is that we, of course, we don't know what next year will bring, but the assumption is certainly that we would work within our current our current structure. Uh, I think what the Secretary has described to you and what the Chairman described is a realigning and reorienting of our uh, the current resources that we have. One follow one quick uh, truth and advertising question. Last year for 07, you projected a $443 billion budget versus yes, 439. Right. Uh, why the $4 billion? Why couldn't you fight to get that restored? Uh, well, certainly we make uh, our case uh, and uh, we, we feel that we have a very healthy budget here. I will say that uh, the, the Congress uh, enacted a budget that was a little bit lower. Uh, and that certainly uh, was some uh, guidance to uh, the administration as to what the, the Congress might be interested in funding. So, uh, but we feel that we have an extremely healthy budget here. We are 7 percent over the enacted level. Uh, we've got a lot uh, to, to work with here. So, so where, where would that f extra $4 billion have gone? What, what were the tough choices that had to be made? Uh, well, we've, we make a lot of tough choices. Uh, there are certain, um, certain uh, systems that uh, we did not uh, fully fund. Uh, we adjusted and restructured some programs. Uh, you, many of you are familiar with what we do in terms of adjusting programs. I mean, you can't do it always on the schedule that you want to do. Um, and was you, I, there will be breakout sessions with the services so they can answer some of those more specifically with you. Yes. Uh, the war in Iraq is being funded primarily through supplementals. It looks mm -hmm. like you're on a pace to spend about $10 billion a month. Do you see that pace continuing on for what period of time? And also, can you point to any other, anything else that was built into the budget that primarily is going towards the war in Iraq uh, that also obviously benefits over time? Yeah. I think our current costs are running about $6.8 billion, and that's a little bit up from last year, and the reason is we have included, as many of you know, uh, costs for resetting the force in the supplementals. Uh, our equipment is wearing out at a significant pace, and so the, we've, been, we've been actually uh, uh, quite successful in working with Congress to make sure that, that we procure that. Uh, but uh, we don't, I'm not going to make predictions about the future. Uh, we develop our supplementals based on uh, the deployment orders that that are out there at the time, and so we will continue to do so in the in the in the future. I'm not going to be in the projection. The 6.8 billion, just to just mm -hmm. to double check, because it's about 120 billion if you look uh, at I, fiscal year 06. So I, I'll tell you what. Let me take another question, and we'll be glad to clarify numbers with you uh, after the after the. Well, it's actually on that that line of questioning about <laughs> supplemental. In the budget process, do you ever foresee a time? when there wouldn't be supplementals and it would just be one budget. Some people in, co in Congress say this is a giant shell game to kind of move money that's not listed. Let, let me clarify uh, a, a point. Uh, the administration will be requesting a budget amendment to the 07 uh, budget, uh, so we will be amending the budget. Um, we have included some things in the past like modularity and supplementals, which we have talked to you about is included in the baseline. Um, I, we understand the concerns in Congress, and we're working very carefully with them. We just briefed, uh, as the Secretary said, many of the uh, chairman and ranking members of their, our committees of concern. So we'll just have to keep working. Can you talk at all about some of the programs that are, uh, that are going away? Uh, for instance, the Air Force is, has mentioned that the <laughs> F-117 stealth fighter, which everyone is familiar with, is going to be <clears throat> essentially retired. I mean, what uh, the programs do people know and love today are going to be uh, retired as part of this budget? Uh, I can talk to some of that. Uh, and again, I think in the individual breakout sessions, you can get more detail if you'd like. F-117 you brought up. Uh, this is a function of modernization on the Air Force's part uh, as they bring on more capable aircraft, uh, in particular the F-22. Uh, it allows them to take uh, older aircraft that are getting long in the tooth, that are costing more to maintain, more to fly. Uh, and have uh, uh, some of their uh, capabilities starting to reduce uh, allows them to get out and modernize the, for the force. So the uh, F-117 uh, is one example of that. Uh, you'll find in there also we talk about uh, phasing out the U-2 as we bring on more uh, assets in the terms of uh, Global Hawk and other assets, uh, satellite systems. Uh, that's in there. Uh, we look at, uh, at adjusting some of our uh, 
Uh, other equipment, uh, example, the uh, airborne laser we'll have is a uh, uh, more of a demo program now. Vice, uh, in last year's budget, you would have seen uh, several aircraft in that. Um, uh, that's some of the examples of things that uh, have changed in there. How about the E-4Bs? Aren't you, are you phasing those out, too? Are you going to retire those? Uh, no, the E-4B, we'll look at uh, eventually we will uh, on those. Uh, and there are some uh, thoughts today about uh, what we replace those with because, as you well know, those are very difficult aircraft to maintain. Uh, and we have some ideas and thoughts for how to uh, bring on uh, new assets that uh, uh, will be much uh, more capable and more maintainable. Uh, despite uh, reasonably strong retention rates, the um, department foresees potential uh, problems down the road with retention, even obviously with some recruiting. 2.2% across the board pay raise is, is the lowest, I think, since 1994. I wonder if you could kind of speak to that and also how these targeted pay raises may kind of address some issues. Uh, certainly. I, in fact, you, Admiral Chanik may want to talk to the uh, senior enlisted piece. Uh, I, w I believe I mentioned this. We've got a billion nine in the budget for recruiting and retention. And the specific uh, targeted uh, increases, I think, will be very important to a senior uh, enlisted admiral, do you want to come? You bet. No, it's the, uh, the targeted issues are, uh, as we look across the force, uh, we always look for uh, what we call force management tools uh, to uh, make sure that we have the ability to retain those people with special skill sets. Uh, and that's what that targeted uh, pay uh, increases are, uh, primarily to the senior enlisted force and to some of our warrant officers. Uh, special skill sets there we want to retain. Example, uh, Special Operations Forces uh, is, is a good one. Those with uh, particular language skills, uh, those are types of folks that uh, we might target for those uh, particular things. Given the kind of work that everybody's been doing the last few years and how busy everybody is, it seems counterintuitive maybe to some that 2.2 would be a low pay raise given every, how busy everybody's been the last few years. Is that, is that off the mark or why 2.2 um, now? Right. Uh, I, I don't know if, uh, one, I don't think it's off the mark. I think it's, uh, it's a continuing effort to make sure that uh, we work uh, towards uh, uh, parity, if you will, in pay uh, for our military forces that uh, the equivalent uh, civilian educated, if you will. Uh, the 2.2 is uh, what we think is, is about the right amount, um, and uh, that's, uh, that's really the selection behind it. It's, it's, it's based on the economic uh, index. Uh, yeah. I would just one last point, and then we'll take another question over here. Uh, the, we're, the pay is up 29 percent since 2001, so it's an important area for us, and uh, we want to make sure we pay our folks right. Uh, can you? Yeah. I'm okay. sorry. Can you break down Go the ahead. supplemental request? How much of the supplemental is reset equipment, and how much is personnel costs in, in broad categories? Yeah, we will be submitting a, a couple of things with regard to supplementals. The fiscal year 06 supplemental we expect to be submitted to the Hill in about uh, two weeks. Uh, the details of that have not yet been settled. Uh, the majority of it will continue to fund our operations uh, costs. Uh, I, I will point to, I think last year we spent about $16 billion, however, for reset. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to uh, tried to give you the details of what we will be submitting in a couple of weeks uh, until I know the full effect of that, but but probably in that area. Two weeks, the one that you're submitting in two weeks is $70 billion, or is that the $50 billion? The, what, the, what the OMB announced the other day was that they had in the budget, an al they had estimated approximately $70 billion. Uh, the details have not yet been finalized. I don't know if it will be exactly $70 billion or more or less. We're, we're working those details. Yes. Yeah, the TRICARE increases, I wonder, Admiral, if you can talk to the rationale behind that for retirees and, and the support for those increases by, by the Joint Chiefs. When we you bet. Dr. Winken were to come up, too, if we don't mind. Oh, we, go. <laughs> we got we'll the have, we'll we got to have the good doctor here. Now. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I just ask you, Admiral, if you yeah. can take the question about the Joint Chiefs and their support for sure. these increases? Sure. Um, in fact, uh, Joint Chiefs do support uh, this particular initiative. Uh, I'd emphasize again, this does not affect active duty. Uh, it affects those between retirement and, the, and uh, 65 years of age. Uh, and it is uh, an attempt to go back to the share ratio or approach the share ratio that was established in 1995 and hasn't changed. The 
the amount that the individuals pay has not changed since that time. The ratio has obviously gone down uh, for the individual and up for the Department of Defense. So all that being said, uh, that's why it has the support of the, uh, of the Joint Chiefs. And I'll let the doctor talk to you. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just add, uh, well said, uh, is that we, we have a fantastic health benefit. We have the, uh, I think could be argued, the best health benefit plan of any, any plan in the, in the country. We want to sustain that. That's our objective. Of course, uh, we know the great job our people have been doing, saving lives, preventing injuries uh, in theater. The operational component of that, we know one of your community was, was uh, saw the benefit of that recently, the, the, the newsman from, from ABC, Mr. Woodruff, and his, his uh, cameraman. Uh, we want to sustain that really important capability. We also want to continue to sustain a, a really great health benefit. And I think an important point to note, two things I'll say just to add on to what's been said, is we will tier these changes so that those retired officers would pay more than senior enlisted uh, and more in turn than junior enlisted so that the incremental impact would only be for junior enlisted about 17 cents uh, per person per day for a family of three uh, r rising up to about 86 cents uh, per person per day uh, for, for a retired officer and his or her family uh, and so uh, uh, these would be stepped in over a couple of years. Uh, and then, of course, we would make some adjustments in our farm pharmacy uh, to incentivize the use of uh, generics and, uh, and mail order. How but those figures per day compared to what they're paying now? Uh, they're, they are uh, just, again, on officers about 42 cents per person per day, going to like $1.28. For a family, that's per person for an average family of three retired, and so again, it's uh, it's an increase, but it, th that those changes do not even bring back to the level of sharing that we saw uh, in 1995. At the end of the day, what we want to achieve, and we will achieve, is continue to sustain a health benefit plan that is better than any health benefit plan you would find in the in the private sector. So. Can you talk about funding for the expanded IED task force? Uh, I'll begin to talk to that in terms of the dollars, and I'll let the Admiral talk about the IED uh, situation. Uh, the IED task force has been at work for uh, several years, and we've spent uh, over $2 billion uh, so far. We intend to uh, provide another, this year, spend about $3.3 .3 billion uh, for the task force. That, that's We'll spend as we need to in order to address the threat. It's a significant one, and I'll let the Admiral talk to the uh, capabilities we're looking toward there. Uh, the uh, joint, I joint IED Task Force has now changed to the Joint IED Task Organization. Uh, it's gone from uh, being led by a one-star to being led by a retired four-star. It's going to increase from approximately 170 people up to about 370 people. So it's a very major effort that we have uh, to work uh, this problem. This is a problem we're working across the entire spectrum. Uh, technology is important, but as important, if not more important, because we have a thinking adversary out there, are the tactics, the techniques, and the procedures. Uh, technology takes time to get uh, into the fight. Uh, we, we compress that as much as we possibly can. Uh, but while it takes time for technology to come in, we can adjust uh, virtually instantaneously our tactics, our techniques, and our procedures. So this is a substantial effort. Uh, the uh, General Meigs, the four-star, reports directly to the uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense. Uh, it has uh, nothing but the highest visibility in the efforts of the department to make sure that we are doing all that we can do to uh, combat this particular threat. When you say 3.3 billion, do you mean this calendar uh, year? Let me let me clarify. We have spent uh, 2.7 billion and prior. Uh, we've got another billion nine that the we just received in the supplemental, the recently passed supplemental, and we will ask for <coughs> additional funds in the upcoming supplemental. And I'll give you those details when I get them. Okay. We're going to break now, so you can get to the breakout sessions and pick up your budget materials on the way out. Thank you.